Hello and welcome uh, to this Mining Journal Lithium panel as part of our battery metals focus as we close in on the back of 2021. My name is Chris Can, Mining Journal Managing Editor, and joining me I have two emerging lithium groups who are complemented by one of Australia's leading mining analysts. Today we're going to look at the financing environment for lithium developments and how demand created by the energy transition is stoking the price and changing the dynamics of the lithium space. With me, I have Argosy Minerals Managing Director Yerko Zvela, Gallon Lithium Managing Director Juan Pablo Vargas de la Vega, or JP, uh, as we'll know him going forward. Um, and both of these groups are looking at development stage assets um, in Argentina with uh, Brian Lithium uh, Development. And then with us, we also have Canaccord Genuity Head of Mining Research Australia, Reg Spencer. Welcome, everyone. So we'll get straight into uh, the, the obvious point around the pricing for, for lithium this year. Carbonate prices are up circa 300% across uh, product markets since the start of the year. How much of this is based on a short-term squeeze in terms of nothing coming through in the pipeline based on current demand? And then how much is reflective of a, a growing end user market? And perhaps that's a good one to start um, with, or with Reg. Thanks, Chris. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think uh, in the most part, the price performance this year would, would be attributable to the lack of, of supply of products. So it's it short term influences. And that in itself, uh, you, you might also argue was driven by the lack of investment through the down cycle uh, that we saw through 2019 and 2020. Uh, so when prices were low uh, through that period, uh, you, you had investment in new projects slowed down, you had uh, capacity that was uh, in production curtailed. Uh, and uh, as we know, um, you know, it, it, you can't just turn the tap on uh, and, and bring on new supply. There is substantial lead times, high capital intensity. So um, I think 2020 surprised us all with the strength of uh, EV sales and, and the recovery in demand. And that's uh, you know, really playing out and manifesting itself in, in that strong price performance so far this year. Um, uh, I, I think in terms of um, uh, the, the outlook going forward and uh, how uh, the, the future view uh, or, or the future outlook for, for demand uh, is, is reflected in current price, I, I think that's a similar factor. Uh, as I said, you know, that, that lack of new supply or the fact that uh, supply growth is likely to fall short of demand growth is, is further putting pressure on consumers to want to secure supply of raw materials today. Uh, so again, you've, you've got um, you know, supply pressures pushing up pricing uh, or lack thereof, and you've got demand pressures uh, pulling pricing up. So it's, it's a, a pretty powerful uh, situation. When we went back to the, the 2018 uh, collapse in prices uh, that you, re you referenced there, a lot of chat was around people not understanding how much lithium supply could be brought on within major operations. Do you think that was over-egged? Do you feel like actually people have underestimated um, how big this market is going to be and the pipeline genuinely is bare or, or could we potentially be looking at a bit of a repeat there? Um, I, yeah, in my opinion, I, I think uh, the, the fact that prices did fall reflects the supply and demand fundamentals. So at that time, we were seeing supply in excess of demand. Uh, we, we can't escape from Economics 101 in, in this particular instance. Uh, the, the risk of a repeat, I think, is, is low. Uh, as I said, you know, demand growth is, is clearly running uh, well in excess of, of supply growth. And every project or, or, or the fact that there are long lead times to deliver new projects uh, uh, mean that uh, for every project that's delayed, uh, one year, you've got demand that's growing by 20%. So if, if we say that the whole industry didn't invest in new capacity for two years, that's 20% on 20% on the market. So you get this compounding effect on, on demand. Uh, and again, I, I, see, I, I see that taking place today. The fact that there was no new investment in capacity through 19 and 20, um, and even existing capacity was brought offline. Uh, and in the meantime, demand continues to grow. Yeah, it really starts to manifest itself in a, almost a perfect storm for pricing. Yeah, Yoko, okay. you're obviously close to the market in, uh, in having to plan for your developments. Um, what's, what's your outlook? What are you factoring in when you're looking at the expectations for building your models looking forward? Yeah, and as you said earlier, Chris, obviously the price has gone up considerably. Uh, lithium chemicals price 300%, as you mentioned. And maybe just something that Reg didn't um, mention there was, uh, you know, obviously this 
demand driven. Uh, and at the moment, it really is a, a China focused story. It's, uh, you know, all the demand is coming out of China. They're the, they're the, they're the, they're the, uh, the market that needs it most. They're the ones that need it now. And, and that's why they're paying up. And that's why we're seeing a lot of activity in the sector and why these China spot prices are up towards $30,000 a tonne. Um, you know, when you sort of start planning as, as you sort of question there, um, you know, and we're all sort of wondering what that long-term average price will be to, to, for, for planning our projects. Um, but, you know, that, that's not taking into account North America and European markets coming online, uh, you know, probably over the next three to four years, perhaps, or maybe sooner, hopefully, uh, and what impact that's going to have. Because, um, you know, just speaking offline with, with Reg a bit earlier, um, you know, what's, what's that demand... Uh, situation going to be like in the next three to five years? Is it, is it going to keep growing? And, and, and you know, if, if China keeps going the way it has been, especially this year, and we're adding these new markets in, um, you know, you can only, and we're, we're coming from the company side, so we love a high price. Um, but, you know, we, it's hard to not get excited by, you know, the, the, the potential sort of you know, numbers you could put into your, your modelling, because, um, you know, if that demand does come strong and stay strong, and, and, and as Reg mentioned, it, we did have a bit of a fall away earlier, uh, you know, 2018 and, and the last couple of years, um, but it just seems like that 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 demand is a lot more real this time. Um, you know, we're seeing governments put a lot more you know stimulus and, and efforts into driving this uh, this EV markets and, and associated markets. So um, you know, for us uh, specifically, um, you know, it, you obviously got to be conservative, but it feels like uh, these these sort of prices are here to stay for the you know, at least the short to medium term. And, uh, and obviously that helps us with, with getting new supply into the market by, you know, encouraging investment into the sector and, and hopefully uh, into, new, into new production operations over the next few years. You're talking about the market looking a bit more or feeling a bit more real there. I see both Reg and JP nodding along with that. It would it be a reasonable statement to say that um, the market has matured previously, maybe a lot of speculation, uh, quite an immature market, and very, very quickly, it's become a market that people understand a lot better, um, and it feels driven by genuine demand as opposed to speculation. Yeah, um, so Reggie's absolutely. probably a good one. To, oh, sorry. Go on, JP. JP why, don't, JP, why don't you jump in first, and then we'll see if Reggie has anything to add. Uh, well, from, from our, our end, I, I concur with what Jake was saying. It's... Um, it's given us a good platform for advancing our projects and, and, and getting things online as soon as we can. We're getting all excited about what we're seeing. And um, it's, we're doing this with a big smile. And, and we definitely want to get to, to market um, as soon as possible. And uh, the bottom line on, in, on this is, uh, um, I was joking early on, but uh, we have not seen this change in 100 years when the horses got retired from the market and the combustion engine came in. Now they bought the boat, uh, electric boat has sailed and it's not going back. You know, the, the commitment for the, the, um, the industry to completely change to electric vehicles and hence being powered by um, batteries at this stage, it's, it's massive. So that's what's driving this massive deficit that we uh, are seeing going forward into the future. And, um, and from our end, we're trying to think of ways of how we can get to market as quick as we can as well. Reg, just specifically, um, both these guys are looking at uh, development stage studies and maturing those studies. When you're looking at a price to factor in, what are the things that you need to be thinking about? What's a reasonable price? I know different projects are, have, have got different quality of product, et cetera, but what are some of the other factors that companies need to be looking at for market credibility and what kind of pricing do you think is reasonable to factor into a feasibility study at the moment? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, our long-term pricing based on our own supply and demand modelling uh, sits at about $15,000 a tonne for chemicals and $800 a tonne for sporogamine, which is about 50% of where the market is today. Uh, and, and to put that into context, uh, if, if we look at the current product pricing for lithium uh, in a market that uh, on an LCE basis is only in deficit this year by about yeah, 50,000 tonnes, you know, what happens in 2027 when we're looking at a 200,000 tonne or a uh, on our numbers by 2020, uh, uh, sorry, 2030, a million tonne deficit. So I, I, I think, uh, and, and sorry, and another extension of that, given the supply that the market requires in order to satisfy that demand uh, and the capital that's required to do that, um, noting the capital intensities for, for projects are increasing. And if we you know, look at averages today at about, let's just call it $15,000 a tonne, upstream uh, lithium capacity needs about 30 billion odd dollars 
invested in it to meet that 2030 demand number. So we need high pricing. Uh, so to, to answer your question, Chris, I think uh, a, a price uh, well in excess of $15,000 a tonne is sensible. Um, I, I don't think you're gonna see a price lower than that, but as a conservative mining analyst, um, we're, we're probably happy to stick with the, around that $15,000 a tonne, although it is starting to make us a little look a little bit silly at the minute, I, I will admit that. I don't think investors are bothered with people who are taking conservative views on these things. I think it's probably more the you know the other side of the equation when they start getting a bit twitchy. Um, JP, if we could move on to financing, obviously Gallon, you know, as well as Argosy, both of both of you guys are looking at uh, financing for that next stage of your um, of your development quite seriously now. What are the factors that you're look you're looking at? What are the pathways that um, you're likely to go down when you consider the available, um, the available sources from public markets to traditional debt through to strategic partners and specialist investors? Well, there, there are a few ways uh, that we can look into how to get funding into our next development phase. Uh, in our, from our end, uh, we're still probably 12, 18 months away from doing so, but um, we'll really think about how we can get there. And assuming that things are gonna get you know, but stronger as uh, uh, Rich has been pointing out. The, um, we tested the equity market a few months ago. We raised $50 million and uh, we were way well oversubscribed into what we wanted to do. So that was a, a big test for us. Now, in terms of uh, development funding, uh, you have the usually uh, debt and equity um, tools available to do so. But um, then on the other hand, uh, it's been proving when the markets are hot that you can get offtakes that actually uh, you can monetize um, part of the offtake with, with an investment or loan or, or something hybrid that allows you to also um, dilute less and uh, being able to deploy that money into development. So all the same things that we were seeing when the market was hot a few years ago, we, we may start seeing them um, this time again and then probably even stronger. Given the, the high demand uh, of lithium required going forward and so from our end, we're definitely looking forward to the next year and see where it's gonna where we're gonna land. And um, in the meantime, we are developing our studies. But um, it's a it's a market uh, that I have not seen before in terms of uh, you put your hand up and funding it's uh, coming from different ends and different interests and and even different industries um, are looking into moving to into lithium. So it's it's it probably it's a perfect storm in terms of funding too. Yeah, okay. has that been your experience? And specifically, I, I suppose I'm interested in the increased level of understanding among probably retail investors to a degree, but also institutional investors and, and traditional debt providers um, looking more seriously at the lithium space and understanding it. Yeah, listen, there's definitely a lot more interest in the sector, as you said. Uh, their level of understanding, I still, you know, and again, probably a good one for Reg, she'll probably speak to a lot more people than we do, but. Uh, I still think there's a lot more learning to come. I think it's, you know, it's obviously been a hot market in the last, especially the last three months, but, you know, generally this year, um, you know, people are following the money and, you know, especially the retail investors, I guess. So, you know, what sort of level of understanding do they have? This is a very much a, you know, a specialised uh, business. Uh, it's not a commodity. It is a, a chemical product. It's about chemical processing, not mining, not exploration, uh, you know, where traditional... Uh, investments are made based on certain criteria. Uh, this is different. You know, uh, people like Paul Graves from Live and always say this is this is not a mining business. This is a chemical processing business. And um, you know, being a geologist myself, I don't know too much about chemical processing, but in terms of the specifics. But on you know, we we do know that we have to focus, and that's the core part of the business. Get that chemical processing right because you know, as people keep telling us, you know, we're, we're feeding the the battery market, and you've got to have a, a battery quality product to supply that market and, uh, you know, how much intelligence and, and perhaps that's too strong a word, but how much understanding is there of, of those finer points? Um, you know, I still think there's probably a lot more learning to, to come uh, over coming years. Uh, obviously the guys that are investing in the sector in, in larger proportions, I'm sure they, they've had a quick learning curve over the last 12 months. Cause as JP said, there's a lot more money that's come in from, from you know, non-traditional sources. Um, and then, you know, specifically to us in terms of uh, developing our project, obviously we're in, we're in construction mode now for a 2000 tonne per annum operation, which uh, hopefully we'll get into production or plan to get into production by mid next year. Uh, that was done by equity uh, that we raised earlier this year. 
But in terms of the larger funding for, for the 10,000 tonne expansion that we're looking to do uh, post the, the completion of that 2,000 tonne operation, uh, as JP said, it's, it's probably outside sources and, and your non-conventional uh, funding that, that's probably the most attractive at the moment. You know, the, obviously, you know, equity side of things is, is available for sure. Uh, debt markets, I think, you know, some of these guys are still learning about this sector. You know, there's probably been a few difficult uh, um, companies, or not difficult, but difficult projects that have, have fallen by the wayside. And I guess the mask is probably the one that we all are familiar with where some of those debt guys, you know, didn't have a great experience. Um, but as JP said, what we've seen is those groups that want offtake uh, because they need to secure product and that's, you know, company level to strategic national level. You know, some of these, you know, obviously, as I said earlier, you know, China's really driving it at the moment. And, you know, depending on how you see things out of China, whether it's a national strategy or an individual strategy, but there's other, other groups that are, are following that path and realising if they don't, they don't act soon, you know, with the limited supply that's out there, they're going to miss out. So, you know, we've had to, you know, we've had a few groups and we've had to say to them, oh, sorry, you know, those terms that we've almost agreed on probably don't uh, stack up anymore because the market's moving that fast, the price is moving up. Um, you know, we're going to need, you know, you to meet the market and the market's keeps giving us better terms. And, um, you know, we're very much looking forward to, you know, maybe over the next three to four months coming out with a, with a CapEx financing solution for the 10,000 tonne per annum expansion project. And, you know, I think that's probably going to be with a strategic type group or groups. And there's going to be a lot of offtake prepayment involved. And, uh, you know, again, as JP said, that's great for existing shareholders, less dilution. Um, you know, it's great when people like Reg say that the prices you know, long-term forecast is $15,000 because most of our projects are, are doing very well at $15,000 a tonne, but, you know, at twenty dollars or $25,000 a tonne, they're doing marvellously. And, and, you know, when you see some of the transactions that have happened in the market over the last few months, and let's use Zijin and Neo, Neo Lithium as an example, where maybe when it happened, everyone thought I was a little bit paying over the odds, but, you know, even for our, our example, 12,000 tonnes per annum times $20,000 a tonne, less cost, that's putting a lot of uh, cash flow into your business and a lot of revenue into your business that, you can deploy and, and, and do a lot of stuff with and it really is going to give everyone a chance to you know really build their business and you know and, and really show that there's a lot more value on the table to get into production and, and that's exactly the way we're going and if we can get those sort of terms locked in like I said over the next few months uh, that really sets us up to to not only get to 12,000 tons per annum but really look to expand and, and grow the business given the you know the demand hopefully that's coming and, and people like Reg are, 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 are you know saying if there's a 600,000 ton uh, per annum uh, uh, short or was it whatever the number was by 2030 a big number um, you know, that's, yeah that's going to be a great great place to be in as a, as a producer because um, you know it, it is hard to bring these projects into production it does take time when you look at Oracobra it took you know it took them a fair amount of time uh, I'm sure we've all learned uh, from that and, and going to try to expedite in the next coming years but yeah it's a, it's a good place to be in at the moment Chris. Reg I wanted to ask you specifically about the public equity markets um, Yoko's talked about some of the technical knowledge that's been uh, that's been acquired and developed around the lithium, lithium space specifically, but battery metals more generally. Is that something that you see reflected and is that important or do, do, do public equity markets essentially just see the price going way up? They want to hear people like you say it's going to keep going and then they'll pile in or, or is, it, is, is it actually more sophisticated than that? I would say that uh, investors' understanding of, of the market has is, 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 is improved dramatically uh, over the last, let's say, four or five years. Uh, you know, if you scroll back to uh, you know, lithium boom 1.0 in 2017, 2018, uh, we were still talking about the differences between brine and spodumene and you know, how you convert a spodumene into a chemical. Uh, this time around, uh, the I would say the investors are far more nuanced and far more sophisticated with respect to how they look at projects and how they look at equity investment opportunities. Um, clearly, you've got a difference between your retail uh, investor and your uh, more sophisticated institutional investor. Um, with respect to the institutions, uh, their understanding is, is uh, well, it, 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 it's improved dramatically, I, I would say. And, and in fact, um, you know, most investors that, that I would speak to in, in uh, and fund managers uh, have got a very good handle on, on the market dynamics and, and, and the project uh, specifics. Um, what I think is moving rapidly and evolving rapidly, the financing of projects is evolving almost as rapidly as the, the industry itself. Um, as, as the guys alluded to, you know, last cycle around, uh, projects were predominantly funded by equity. Uh, a little bit of high cost, uh, let's say non-conventional project finance was involved. 
Uh, but this time around, as the guy suggested, you, you, if, if you're seeing not only equity, but you're also starting to see the availability of more conventional uh, project finance and, and project banks. Uh, you're also seeing um, the involvement of, of strategics and not just uh, groups that are involved in the industry themselves. Um, and, you know, Yurko's example of Zijin Mining, you know, a gold miner out of China looking to acquire a, a, uh, a lithium brine project in Argentina. So, uh, and that even excludes the involvement of the OEMs, which we haven't really seen yet. So, um, all up, I would say that the public equity market's understanding of the market is improving, um, but the, they're always playing catch up as, a, you know, the, the, the industry itself is evolving uh, very, very quickly. And, and one, must, uh, one must spend a lot of time uh, uh, understanding how, how that evolves uh, and what that means for, for, for one's investments. I think an example of that would be uh, the, the way that the industry is, is um, moving towards certain cathode chemistries. You know, if you asked me 12 months ago what would be the predominant cathode chemistry in the market, I would have said a, a nickel-based ternary cathode. But, you know, as we see today, um, you know, there seems to be a, a very significant pushback towards LFP. And what does that mean for lithium demand? Well, that means, a, a, you know, improved demand for lithium carbonate over lithium hydroxide, you know, things like that. So um, uh, I, I think uh, the way that the industry is evolving is certainly going to keep investors on their toes and require them to continue to learn uh, and evolve with the market. JP, maybe if I can direct this one at you. It's around probably taking a step away from the specific lithium market when you're having conversations with investors. Uh, and just looking at uh, the ESG questions that you're being asked at the moment, um, is, you know, a panel is not complete these days without an ESG question, so I thought we, we should get it in there. Um, do groups look at, uh, at Gallon and, and, and ask questions around exactly how you're looking to develop your project, your community um, objectives and commitments? all these elements, or are they more swayed by what you're producing and the fact that you're, um, that you're contributing to an energy transition to a better world, or is it a genuine mix of these things? And also, is that a big part of the conversation or is it a sideline issue for you? Well, um, it's, it's, a, it's a global picture, I guess. Uh, and the reason why we, we end the lithium business here is to supply the, the electric vehicles with batteries and uh, that's the change in in the revolution to get a greener cut, uh, a greener world, and look, the uh, the importance has, uh, from what I've seen, initially was not on the radar, people's radar, but people went to, to invest in lithium, and now it's getting more, more, and more people want to understand how you're doing things, what are you doing, what it does mean for the community, um, are you employing people uh, from the community, what impacts do you have in flora and fauna, and 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 so on, and to to the way to understanding. What's your carbon footprint? So the, all those questions, while they're not in the past, we're not that strong. They they are, are growing questions that are we are covering. And uh, I have to say, uh, from our end in Argentina, and we are at the Catamarca province, to get the production permit, you have to have a um, flora and fauna study that needs to be approved. And you have to have an archaeological study, so you make sure you don't disturb anything that has been there for a while. And lastly, you have to have a social license. So you have to explain to the community what's your work plan, what are you going to do, how are you going to make sure you maintain a standard and a benefit to the community. So that, that's something that are, uh, for us is important. And we have been very close to to the community. And being a smaller company, we have a different type of type of um, uh, dealing with the communities because our, our team is new and uh, and we we have been able to deploy ourselves in a different in a different way with a new with a new way of doing things uh, rather than a large mining company it's a bit detached uh, in the past of what we've seen but uh, from our point of view I think that what they're done in, uh, doing and uh, currently doing in Argentina is is a good way to to face um, what is this need to and we're trying to also employ local people. And trying to train them uh, as well. So, it's um, I'm the founder of Galan, and as you you know, you have an idea of lithium exploring, but then you find the social aspect of things. And uh, in, in in when when you start seeing that you start giving jobs to people and you make see that people change people's lives, and even through COVID, you know, that it's um, Argentina has been highly hit by COVID. So we we been all along in Argentina, we made a donation as well with respirators in in Catamarca to try to 
um, help you know locally with uh, with COVID while we were there. So there is there is a um, a human factor that we're not forgetting, and we are trying to make sure that it works. This is at a, a as a company level. And then the question, yes, they do get asked uh, by investors and. And from our end, we also understand that uh, the uh, lithium brine coming from, so the lithium coming from brines has a, a low impact CO2. And the reason being uh, the technology that we are uh, proposing to use is conventional technology. We use the sun to our advantage. We uh, don't add chemicals. Well, we, what we have to add uh, there is lime. And lime is not a chemical. It's just, it's naturally extracted. So we, we do see that um, whilst our operation will have an impact. There's no doubt that every mining operation will have an impact, but we have a, a greater benefit for, for the community and the world as well in what we're trying to do. So the, the ESG, and I think this is across mining, you know, taking more into consideration and what else can you do to uh, reduce your carbon footprint? What else can you do to help the community? And uh, because in the, um, our projects being brine projects, are, they, are very, they have a, a, a significant longevity. You're talking about 20, 30 years in terms of uh, the operations and and uh, even beyond. So we want to be able to get it right and try to be there with the community. And and I've seen the impact that uh, all mining operations do in this part of the world where, you know, they're, they're not the most um, affluent uh, part of, of Argentina. And we can see that we can make a, a significant difference by being there. And it's not just about throwing money. It's uh, what to do with your money to get the best benefit for the community as well. JP, you mentioned in there uh, the social license, um, obviously as part of the permitting process. Just to be clear, this is a, a social license, not in uh, in the way that we've we've used to used to understand it, more of an ambiguous term, something that's not actually written down in black and white. Um, there's something that you have to go and acquire and establish and prove um, as more of an abstract concept. Are you talking about a social license that is part of the permitting that will have hurdles to clear and is in black and white? Yeah, well, the social license you you have to engage with the community. You have to present our plan, uh, at least in Catamarca, we have to present our plan of what are, what's Galan's plan for the community? How are we gonna benefit the community? What, where's, where is our investment in, this, in the community? So it's not only about jobs um, and our key areas of focus for us that we can also control and help and see the results is health and education. So these are the key things that we're trying to focus that we can make a difference. But uh, yes, when you present things at large at the community in the end, and we have to do this also for drilling. Together, our drilling permits, we have to explain to the community what we're doing. And the, you, you're in front of uh, um, 200 people or thereabouts, you know, and they all listen to your plan. Then they, they ask questions, you have to answer them. And at the end of that, this conversation that goes for hours, by the way, it's not just one off. Um, it's uh, quite colorful <laughs> at the same time. But um, look, I do, I do see the value of it and I see the value of uh, people engaging and when people are rational and uh, they can voice their concerns, you try and you also have the time to come out with an answer. So um, the, whilst the process is, you know, it can be improved and there are things that can be improved. I think it's a good start uh, for, for this and the community at the end of the day, the representative of the community sign on this and the government signs on this as well, the local government. So yes, it is something in, yeah, that you have a piece of paper saying that, yeah, we commit, they commit, and the government commits. So that's, that's how we operate um, in, in that part of Argentina. Okay. I wanted to go back to a point that was raised earlier by all of you, I think, at some point around um, as the market grows, uh, as the prices grow, as the end user um, consumption is growing and the predictions around that obviously growing much further majors are starting to get involved that previously uh, not discarded this or not um, discounted the space that probably wouldn't be fair but they'd not been tempted in um, it feels like they are being tempted in i know yurko you mentioned the zijin deal there's obviously the Naront uh, saga unfolding as well obviously that's around nickel reg could i just get your view on how you see major involvement in the space and will it essentially play out like we've seen in more conventional um, commodities that we're used to dealing with prior to the battery metals evolution? And are we going to see more m and in the battery metal space, specifically around lithium? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. Uh, if I can start uh, at, at where we are today, 
if you put the, the size of the lithium market uh, into context with where the, the, the super majors sit, so let's say average pricing uh, for lithium through 21 is about uh, $12,000 or $13,000 a tonne. Now that, that implies a market size this year on average of about $6 billion. Uh, you know, if you have a look at Rio Tinto's revenue, for example, in 2021, it's $87 billion. Um, so right now, uh, I, I think that the lithium market is too small for the involvement of these large players. And, you know, the $6 billion market, Rio Tinto probably spends that on stationary at, at this point in time. But that's that's not to say that in the future, as, as we've, we've discussed, um, you know, the market will grow substantially. And even if we just you take spot lithium pricing, for example, and apply that to our expectations for market size, all of a sudden you've got a $15 billion market. Um, and then if you fast forward out to 2030, and we're talking about a two and a half million tonnes of annual demand, uh, you start to do the maths. And all of a sudden, that's a market that does become attractive to a major. Uh, the, your question about the m &A, for the majors to get involved, in my opinion, they're going to want the best assets and uh, achieve the greatest market share. And that's not easy, given that the world's best assets uh, are sitting with some of the, the large incumbents already in the lithium industry, like an Albemarle or an SQM. Um, that doesn't necessarily preclude them from getting involved, however. And, and the analogy I'll use, or the example I'll use, is when Rio Tinto decided it wanted to get into aluminium in 20, uh, 2007. You know, they paid $40 billion for Alcan. Uh, and if we have a look at Albemarle today, it's capped at about $30 billion. And if you throw a control premium on top of that, you know, one of these majors might be paying $40 billion to, to acquire Albemarle, but with it, they get 25 to 30% market share and through the world's best assets. Uh, so I, I think we're going to see the involvement of the majors in time. The industry certainly needs them. It needs their capital. Uh, I, I mentioned before um, how much capital is going to be required in, in expanding upstream capacity to meet a 2030 demand number. And it's you know, 30, you know, plus 30 billion US dollars. Um, it's going to need more than equity investors. It's going to need more than uh, the involvement of, of uh, a few fund managers and, and, and a few uh, debt providers. It's going to need uh, companies that can write big checks. And, and this is where I think the majors can play a role. One last uh, point I'll make is, is uh, using iron ore as a, as a bit of an example. Uh, going back, say, 10 years, we had an iron ore boom in Australia. You had a junior iron ore sector for that matter, but over time uh, that consolidated with, with most of the water production coming from four companies now. Uh, I see that taking place in lithium over time, uh, where the industry moves away from being highly fragmented and, and being more consolidated, again, driven by a requirement for, for large, uh, large amounts of capital. So, yeah, I, I don't think this is something that's going to happen tomorrow or next week or, or maybe even next year, but certainly within the next decade, I, I think you'll see the entrance of some of these uh, large diversified miners coming in. I suppose the difference with the iron ore analogy, Reg, potentially is that when you look at some of those assets that have been consolidated, they're probably still around the same jurisdictions we're looking at. A lot of it is, is Australia focused. I, one of the concerns you might have around m and and the majors being involved or their concerns, when you look at a group like Rio, for example, um, some of the assets um, are in places that they may traditionally want to stay away from and have had bad experiences. And you look at when they ventured into um, more exotic locations, uh, you know, for example, what's happening in Mongolia for them at the moment, they may be hesitant. Do you see that as a barrier or do you think essentially there's a necessity there the risk is understood. It's a risk that has to be managed and it's inevitable. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting point. Let's have a look at where those major sources of lithium are. And Rio Tinto has already got a presence in, in many of those parts of the world. You know, Australia, uh, if you look at, let's let's just use Albemarle's assets for an example in green bushes uh, and Wajina, they're already active in Australia, as we know, in the Pilbara. Uh, if you have a look at South America, they've got a very big presence in, in Chile through their, through their copper business. Um, so jumping over the Andes and over the border into Argentina, I don't believe would be a big stretch for, for a group like that. Um, where you might get uh, some issues perhaps is, is uh, places like Eastern Europe. We, we know that they're having difficulties with uh, some local opposition towards the Yadar development in, in Serbia. Um, and, and it's those regions where mining doesn't have a large presence uh, uh, and where you get this not in my backyard phenomenon where I, I think they're more likely to have those issues. But uh, yeah, so to answer your question, Chris, I, I don't necessarily see uh, jurisdiction as a, as a major hurdle for, for the entrance of these majors, given yeah, they've, they've got global reach and they're already active in, in half the countries involved. 
Yoko, if, if it's inevitable that this is coming, is that something that you're looking forward to from your perspective as a development group? Or do you, do, would you prefer a more stable dynamic and being able to kind of get on with things for a period before you had to entertain um, a change in environment from a corporate perspective? Yeah, listen, I think further to what Reg said, I think, you know, people, those big majors, they're not going to come and look at uh, Argosy or, or Gallon with all due respect. Uh, they're going to be looking at the Albemarle's and, you know, they need these bigger badars to, to justify their, 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 their involvement in these sort of projects and, and moving into these new commodities. Uh, and, and, and Reg maybe touched on it a little bit earlier as well. Maybe, you know, prior to those guys getting in, as he mentioned, it might be a little while yet, but, um, you know, you've got these OEMs and uh, that's the part where, I guess we're all sort of struggling to work out why these guys haven't, you know, put a foothold into the market yet. And, uh, you know, and, and I guess we're all wondering when, when are they? And, and as I mentioned earlier, the European market hasn't really, you know, required that, that lithium chemical product at the moment, and it might be a couple of years away. So maybe there's a bit of hesitation there, but, you know, I think, you know, from, from a junior sector uh, in, in, in this market, um, you know, that's probably the, the, the part where we're more than happy to entertain those sort of guys, because I think it's a good alignment. Um, you know, those guys need the product, um, you know, they can get involved in at, at company level. They can, you know, they can they can get involved at, at operational level if need be, um, because you know there, there's a, a good supply chain uh, alignment for for both the company and 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 these guys that that need the end product. And uh, you know, I think it'd, it'd be a good thing. Um, like Reg said, we, we're going to need more money to invest in, and it's not going to come from you know traditional current sources because. Um, you know, we're, 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 if, if you're going to meet this, this supply gap, um, we're going to need a lot more money and, and any new sources of, of uh, entrance coming in with, with, you know, hopefully deep pockets is going to be welcomed by all because, um, you know, we, 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 we all want to move forward and we all want to get in production. And if you can align it up uh, with those guys that want that end product, um, you know, it's a, it's a good natural fit, mutual sort of uh, uh, relationship and, and hopefully mutually beneficial for for all the groups involved. So, you know, you know, from our perspective, we'd be more than happy with something like that. I think we're sort of heading towards that direction anyway with, with uh, what we're trying to do at the moment with, with that funding for that next stage. You know, you do need to speak to those end users. Uh, it's those end users that want the product and uh, they're coming up with ways to, to secure the funding, which may be a little bit more easier for them than it is for us as, as junior sort of developers, um, given that, you know, they may be, um, they have, you know, bigger balance sheets or they have access to, to bigger markets to, to bring that money in. So, yeah, we, you know, we, we, I think we welcome it and, and we look forward to what happens over the next couple of years and, and hopefully we can meet the market and, uh, and be able to carry on. If we take it as, as read that perhaps for smaller groups, development groups um, such as Gallon and Argosy, a major, uh, a major influx is potentially a few years off yet. JP, what, what are some of the nuances of, um, of being a, a junior uh, company in the lithium space and particularly I, I guess I'm interested in the challenges is it similar to being a small gold or base metals company are there particularly are there particular challenges that you're faced with being a small group in the lithium space yeah yeah no there, there are uh, I would like to touch on one more point bef um, before moving to your question and and is uh, that the oil and gas sector is a sector that has been pushed to become green so I would like to think that this sector for them is a drop in, in the bucket, the, the type of money that they have and to move into the renewables, something that they're looking, lithium is part of that equation. So I would like to think that they could also come into the, into funding the lithium sector in the future. So, and, uh, and trying to, and into your question, Chris, um, well, look, it's, um, uh, it's good and bad, I guess, about being a, a junior company, but um, you can be nimble, you have flexibility. Uh, I try to look at the positive things that are, are being a junior company allows, you know, you can uh, quickly develop your plans. Uh, I've worked for Rio Tinto, I've worked for uh, BHP in the past, and everything is really slow. Yes, uh, a, a name will give you, it will open the door, you know, don't have to worry about funding and people and, uh, you know, sometimes I joke to people say that I'm also the tea lady, you know, in, at the office because, you know, you have to do everything. But um, the, um, the, the, I guess, you know, trying to get the foot on the door with authorities so they can get to know you and understand who you are and that you're not another company trying to sell a dream and because they've seen many of those before, uh, I guess that's the biggest sort of hurdle from, from my end, trying to demonstrate that uh, uh, to get you know, drilling permits, you know, for instance, uh, no one knew me from a bar of soap in Catamarca. So I have to show my face, be there and constantly bit by bit, 
trying to gain that credibility. So um, it's like any business, you know, this people have to see you doing the right thing and, and, and also doing the things that you say on time and, uh, and trying to stay on budget as well. So whilst there are things that are, are not necessarily ideal compared to a larger company and funding when last year funding was horrible, you know, just uh, Freddy Krueger wrote the script to what 2020 was like. Uh, this year, I'm very pleased with the change, but um, yes, it does give brings time that are you think what's next, how are we going to do it? Something that being a large company, you don't have to worry too much because you know you can uh, face things in a different way. But um, I wouldn't change it if you ask me. You know, it has things that are, are still positive and being able to see things and talk to your shareholders, talk to your stakeholders, being there with the community, have a close team. Um, those are the things that are, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite pleased and I wouldn't change. And yes, there are challenges in there and, uh, and, uh, and for at all levels to gain that reputation. And, uh, and you have to have a lot of luck as well. I mean, we are in the exploration game. Now we are developers, but to get from exploration to developers, you have to find the lithium. So uh, that is until then you, it's all speculation and um, you have to have a lot of luck um luckily from our end we were able to demonstrate that but um it's um you have to cover a lot of um coolness and and stay stay on the game stay positive um and it's not an easy game but uh, it's definitely rewarding reg to me that sounds like a probably a similar story as you'd get from most junior companies it's it's tough you have to be patient you have to be a little bit lucky does that resonate for you or do you actually see some differences, some nuances between when you're talking to investors about a gold play or a base metals play? Is it a different conversation that you would have with those groups when you start talking about the junior lithium sector? A hundred percent, definitely. And, and I think one of the key drivers of that is the nature of the product that's being produced. You know, with gold or with any of the base metals, they are very much commoditized products. Uh, the geology is well understood, the metallurgy is well understood, the processing is well understood. Uh, where in lithium, it's a little bit different. Uh, every single lithium deposit, be it hard rock or brine, has uh, differences relating to its chemistry or its mineralogy. And that means your processing circuits are different. And then not only that, the product you produce at the end of that process uh, will require different specifications to meet their end user requirements. So I, I think uh, lithium is far more nuanced than, than your, your typical gold or base metal development. And, and you know, the, those challenges that we see uh, that, that lithium ju uh, junior lithium companies face, uh, in my opinion, uh, relates uh, mostly around capital and people. Um, up until, as, as JP said, up until very recently, uh, funding a lithium project was challenging. Um, you know, if you look at a, a, a conventional or typical uh, lithium brine, greenfield brine development, you're looking at anywhere from between 400 to, I don't know, call it $800 million. Um, and for a company that might be capitalised at, say, two or 300, that is still a challenge. Um, and perhaps probably a greater one, given that the equity markets and capital markets are now a little bit more enthusiastic about funding uh, juniors and, and junior projects, is people. Um, the lithium industry up until very recently was, and, and even still today is only quite small. And there is not a lot of IP, uh, there is not a lot of experience, uh, which takes decades to build up over time. So, you know, in our opinion, we see uh, people as, as being a major challenge uh, for, for, for junior companies, having the right um, blend of skills and experience in order to successfully deliver a project. I know Yurko uh, made mention of Oracobra earlier, and it's, it's quite a, a good poster child for, um, you know, the, 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 the trials and tribulations that, that projects can face. But that said, you know, there is a benefit of not being a first mover uh, and, and, and being able to learn um, uh, where, where others have perhaps misstepped. So, yeah, uh, to, to, you know, as, as, a, as a wrap up, I, I guess, Chris, you know, the, like I said, the challenges for, for me, for junior companies today is still adequate capital and, and funding and, and uh, having the right skills and experience and people and, and to be able to deliver projects and take them forward. Um, but from an investor standpoint, um, yeah, they're, they're quite nuanced uh, relative to uh, relative to other more conventional commodity markets like gold or base metals. Is that need for experience and the expertise another good reason when you're looking at your basket of financing and your mix of financing for development to bring in a strategic partner that has expertise and has the people to lend to an operation when you're a small company? 
Potentially, potentially. Uh, I, I think the, the, the strategic partnership processes that, that we've seen run uh, perhaps have, have more erred on the side of financial partnerships as opposed to technical partnerships. Uh, you know, those groups that have the technical capabilities and IP uh, are typically your other lithium companies. And, and uh, unless they're looking to acquire you, uh, they're, they're unlikely to share their, their skills and experience with you. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, but that's that's changing. Um, you know, we, we have seen Gan Feng uh, be a little bit more uh, cooperative, uh, perhaps, if, if I could use that word, in terms of uh, partnering up on both a financial and technical perspective on, on projects, be they Brian or Hard Rock. Uh, you know, CATL, uh, perhaps not a great example, but, but certainly uh, involved in the lithium industry. Um, you know, also becoming a, a, a strategic or, and, and technical and, and financial partner. So I think it's going to change. And I, I think given the competition to secure resources and to secure supply of material is going to see some strategic groups uh, have to think a little bit differently about what they offer a junior should, should they go down that partnership process. Thanks very much. That is all we've got time for uh, in this session. Thanks very much for joining us, uh, Reg, JP, and Yurko. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks for having us, Chris. Cheers.